Thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church, Virtual Sunday School class. We're in Isaiah chapter 59. This is lesson 146, and we'll be starting in verse 8. Let us have a word of prayer, and then we'll go into this lesson. Father, we just pray that as we go through your word, that you lead us and guide us by the Holy Spirit that you bring us to the proper conclusions by the same Spirit that gave this writing. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 8. Uh, the way of peace they do not know. So he's still talking about the Israelites. And all of the other People who don't believe in God. The Israelites are the only ones around that are monotheistic. They have the one God. But they have walked away and have started worshiping the very idols that these other people that don't believe in God do. So he says the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their path. They have turned them into crooked roads and one who walks along them will know. No one who walks along them will know peace. They came away from the straight and narrow road, the righteous road of God, and went on the crooked road of those without God. They do not know God, so they cannot know peace. God is the source of peace, external and internal. True peace, which is the inner peace, comes from God, and they don't have it. There are two paths that you can take in life. The godly, straight and narrow path, which leads to righteousness, Jesus' righteousness. Or you can be with the ungodly, wandering around on the broad road that leads to destruction. It's everybody's choice. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. You be that few. You be that few that finds it. There is no peace for those on this broad road because this life is all they have. They will not inherit heaven and eternal life. Don't let that happen to you. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you need help, if you have questions, call me 502-220-1285. Verse 9. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. This is a common confession of their unsaved condition. Moses even wrote this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 29. At midday you will grope about like a blind person in the dark. You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day you'll be oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. Who are you going to turn to? You can't turn to God because you rejected him. And these idols are not going to do it for you. Nobody in this world is going to do it for you. The world's not going to do it for you. Only God. Uh, the Apostle John writes in uh, John chapter 8 verse 12, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Old Testament, 
New Testament, eyewitness apostle. What more do you need? The secret of all this is repenting, changing your mind about what and who you're relying on, changing your mind about how you're living, and come to God so the light will guide you. That is Jesus. Verse 10, like the blind who grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong we were like the dead. <laughs> Old Testament, New Testament, hand in hand. Ezekiel says it best, I think. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. Stop rebelling. Surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Stop, stop, stop rebelling. Jesus came and provided physical as well as spiritual food they feast on the physical, but dismiss the spiritual. Mark, chapter 8, verse 18, another gospel message. Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? These writings are almost 2,000 years apart. How can that be? Verse, uh, chapter 59, verse 11. We all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. For deliverance, but it is far away. They are desperate and in need of a savior. They, nor many of us, will pull ourselves out of the darkness and cling to Jesus. God sent his son to bring light into the world. So whosoever would could be saved. When the light of Jesus shines in your life, it does away with all the darkness. They just need Jesus, their Messiah, to come and awaken them. Come and awaken them. What kind of awakening do you need? You've got the Old Testament. You've got the New Testament. You got eyewitnesses writing their accounts. What more do you need? It's time to stop rebelling. Surrender to Jesus. Now, uh, verses 12 through 14 uh, are a little block in themselves. They're interesting. The prophet supplies the answer to the nation's frustrations. Their sins and transgressions remain as obstacles to God's deliverance. They're going to have trials and tribulations brought by God. Not just consequences they earn, but brought by God through foreign powers. He's using foreign powers to oppress them. Though their external Jewish rituals may be proper, they're still doing those. Their impure motives remain as a hindrance between God and their people. Because they're also worshiping idols in those rituals, too. You can't do both. You can't serve Jesus and the world. You've got to surrender to one or the other. I vote to surrender to Jesus. So let's take a look at verse 12. For our offenses are many in your sight. Yes, we sin a lot. And our sins testify against us. Yes, they do. Our offenses are ever with us. Yeah, we've, we've done it. And we acknowledge our iniquities. That's, the, that's where repentance comes in. You acknowledge. I sinned. Sin is transgression against God. I did it. I'm guilty. But I want to be forgiven. And that change of mind, that stopping rebellion, that turning to Jesus, it's the beginning of your sins being forgiven. 
and you're giving a fresh start, a new life. And one where you're not following the world to get you in more trouble. You're following Jesus. Even if they did sacrifice for their sin, which they would, they would take their animals for sacrifice, uh, it was covered and hidden for a year by the blood of an animal. So they had to do this every year. The blood of an animal did not clear their conscience. Their sins were still there. That's why they had to do it again every year. So if they did this with the right mind and heart, which they did not, it still had to be done every year. But many of them just did it because it's a formality or tradition. That's what we Jews do, is the way they saw it, on their way to the ritual feast for an idol. It takes the precious blood of Jesus to abolish sin eternally, to completely wipe it out. He defeated sin on the cross the only solution for them or us is to accept Jesus as our Savior because he paid the price for our sin. For the Old Testament people, this was also true. They still needed the cross. Peter denied Jesus three times and ended up dying because he refused to deny him anymore. He wrote 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made the proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. While Jesus was in the tomb for those three days, he went to those who were disobedient long ago. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, all these people who didn't have benefit of a Messiah, didn't have the benefit of the cross, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through the water. Jesus went to those people and gave them the choice to accept him and be free of their sins. Verse 13. Stop rebelling. Verse 13, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our back on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. That is the definition of someone who's rebellious. The heart of the carnal man is desperately wicked. The mouth speaks whatever is in the heart. So get Jesus in your heart. Stop rebelling. Luke, another gospel writer, chapter 6, verse 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. They go together like a glove. It's true. It's God's word. God is giving this word to Old Testament people and New Testament people. Same same deal. And then verse 14. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands out of distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. This is just saying with evil men there is no justice. We know that. People are bought to bring testimony into court. Jurors are bought to bring their declaration into court. These evil men, they lie, they cheat to get whatever they want. There's no such thing as a fair trial when you have evil witnesses. With the wicked, there is no justice. Look around. The wealthy always get the better break. The poor always end up in the bottom of the prison. Look around. Well, that's our lesson for today. And uh, even though it's Old Testament, 
even though Isaiah wrote this so well 680 years before the birth of Christ, it's still true today. It's still applicable to our lives as we saw in the New Testament writers how it all comes together. Uh, let us close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for giving us your word. We just pray that as we read Old Testament, as we read New Testament, as we read ancient world history, as we read the newspaper, that we can connect these dots and see Jesus emerge and that we can. We can set aside our rebellion and accept Jesus. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and may we all go in peace.